This video is to help you with the chapter 11 notes on the nervous system. Um, it starts out with just a simple define the nervous system. Um, the top sentence up there gets you essentially what you need. Remember, it is one of our organ systems. The organs that make it up include the brain, the spinal cord, and then the uh, peripheral nerves that are attached to that, the cranial nerves, and then the spinal nerves. Um, the nervous system works very, very quickly. The effects that it has tend to be fairly short-lived, and that's in contrast to the endocrine system that's going to be coming up in AMP2. The principal cells that help carry out the function of the nervous system are the neurons, and this picture down here shows you what's known as a multipolar neuron. It's multipolar because it has numerous dendrites. These are the receiving parts of the neuron. It has a cell body that contains most of the organelles that we talked about way back in Chapter 3. We've got a nucleus and nucleolus. We have mitochondria. We have Raphael that's not called Raphael anymore. We'll get back to that a little bit later on. And then we have one axon that takes the impulse away from the cell body. Um, next, you have what are the three basic functions for the nervous system. And this slide right here shows you all of those. Um, we have sensory neurons that take information from outside of the body and send it to the central nervous system. We have neurons within the central nervous system that integrate that information, and that means that it does something with it. Like, it helps you to understand it. It helps you to see, hey, that's a glass of water. It just tells you some more information about it. So it's interpreting some of the sensory information that comes in. Once the integration system understands what's going on, it can send out a motor output, which can be as simple as, hey, I'm thirsty, let's contract this muscle so that we can take a drink, or as complex as it's time for us to release insulin so we can lower our blood sugar levels. So motor output isn't just about skeletal muscle, it's also about glands that you have in your body as well. After that, you have list and explain the structural and functional divisions of the nervous system. This is the newer picture that's in your textbook. Um, it's not my favorite one in terms of organization, but at least it hits you the highlights. Number one, most important, you have the central nervous system, which I'm going to call CNS for the rest of this. Um, you do need to know what makes it up. It is the brain and the spinal cord. The peripheral nerves are not part of this system. This is the integrating and command center, um, which means this is, again, where that integration or thought process happens. And it's also what sends out the motor output as well. Now, communicating with the central nervous system, you have the peripheral nervous system. And this is where the cranial nerves and the spinal nerves are going to be fitting in. The peripheral nervous system is a two-way channel, which means it sends information up to the central nervous system and it takes information from the central nervous system and sends it out to the motor output. So it's like a two-lane highway if you want to look at it that way. Um, this one, PNS, is the abbreviation for that one, although I usually call it the peripheral nervous system. Um, next up, underneath the peripheral nervous system, you have two divisions. These two divisions basically amount to a divided highway, where part of the information is going northbound, and that's the sensory or afferent division, and you're going to hear afferent a lot from here on out. It means you're going towards something. In this case, what it means is it's sending the sensory information towards the central nervous system. So for this one, you need to know both names, sensory and afferent, and you need to know that it's one way sending information to the central nervous system. After that, you have the motor or efferent division. This would be like the southbound side of the highway. Information is coming from the central nervous system out to whatever motor output we have going on there. Um, efferent is another word that's going to pop up a lot in the, next, in the whole rest of AMP2, quite frankly. So make sure you get familiar with that word. Um, efferent starts with an E, and so does exit. And so this is information that's exiting, in this case, the central nervous system. If that helps you to remember it, go ahead and use it. Um, Next up, the motor system has two branches depending on whether it's something that you're thinking about consciously or whether it's just something that happens. The somatic nervous system is the stuff that you have to think about to make it happen. So somatic is also called your voluntary system, and it only controls the skeletal muscle. On the other hand, you have the autonomic system. This is the stuff that happens automatically. Um, another way to say that is it's the involuntary nervous system. So this is the one that controls cardiac muscle and smooth muscle plus all your glands in your body. Finally, the autonomic nervous system has two divisions, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. What you need to know for the sympathetic is it's also called the fight or flight system. Um, and it tends to speed things up. It speeds up heart rate. It speeds up respiratory rate. It increases blood pressure. Parasympathetic does the exact opposite of that. The other name for the parasympathetic system is the resting digesting system. Um, and it tends to slow things down. It slows down heart rate and respiratory rate. It lowers your blood pressure. The one thing it does speed up is digestion. It helps to release the um, enzymes responsible for that. And it speeds up the smooth muscle so you can push food through that system. 
Um, let's see, after that you have that little bit of group work which we'll do in class. And then finally you have list the types of neuroglia or neuroglia depending on how you want to say it and then cite their functions. Um, first thing that I recommend you do is just define neuroglia. In addition to the neurons that we defined earlier, there are all these other additional cells that are part of the nervous system. They aren't the ones that do communication, but they play a huge role in the function and homeostasis of the nervous system. All of these cells outside of the neurons, they're called neuroglial cells. The four types that you have, we're going to start with astrocytes. Um, it means star cell because they tend to be star-shaped in appearance. Um, the two sentences that it has up here are the perfect ones that I want you to get for this. They create something called a blood-brain barrier. What I want you to notice is in this picture, these little red tubes are capillaries. Notice how the astrocyte completely wraps around the capillary. That means that any drug that a person might have take, taken, it has to pass not just through the endothelium and then whatever basement membrane may be present of the capillary, it also has to pass through these swellings on these ends of the astrocytes. And so it's sort of like, in terms of an analogy, uh, the king used to have food tasters, and if a food was poisoned, this poor person would end up dying. And that would mean that it was poisoned and it would not let the material onto the neuron, which is this big yellow cell in the background. So that's what this cell is doing. It's trying to make sure only the good stuff gets to the neuron. Anything bad is supposed to get stopped with this particular cell. Next up, you have microglia. Um, your whole immune system is not allowed within the central nervous system. It's kind of like the difference between regular police and then the secret police. Regular police would be your whole immune system, and they're allowed everywhere in your body except for the central nervous system. Here we get secret service, which are the microglia. They're still running around and they're performing the function of the immune system. They just are only going to be working in the central nervous system. So same basic function, but specialized cells to do that for us. Um, next up, you have ependymal cells. Um, the ones that we're going to talk about, they have cilia on them. That cilia beats to create a current. The current helps to keep cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF, moving. And then next, and uh, last for right now, oligodendrocytes. If you've ever heard of Schwann cells back in high school, these are the same thing as Schwann cells, only they're in the central nervous system instead of the peripheral nervous system. And um, what they do is they wrap around an axon several times and they create an insulating layer. And so they kind of make impulses travel faster. Now, what I want you to do in your notes is put a bracket to the left of numbers one through four. That's astrocyte, microglial cell, ependymal cell, oligodendrocyte. Once you have that bracket next to those, I want you to write next to that bracket, CNS. Those four types of cells are only present within the central nervous system, and so they're going to be functioning there. Now, this little video that I'm going to link to right here is from a YouTuber who had a specific type of cancer called oligodendroglioma. It was specific to this particular cell right here. This is one of those words that everybody forgets because nobody would heard it before today. It's an important type of cell, and so I'm going to show you this video just so you can see the cell even though they're not working like they're supposed to in this particular gentleman. Um, this is an open brain surgery as he will describe in the video, so if you do not like surgery videos, don't watch this. Most nights, this is Hi, my name is Charles Trippy, and welcome to this video. You're literally about to see the inside of my head and my brain. I'm not kidding. See, there's a scar. I'll prove it. I'm not joking. That's a real scar right there. My surgeons were so cool, they actually let me vlog it. One really interesting part about the surgery is that I was actually awake during the surgery. So I just want to give you guys a fair warning that this video is very intense and it actually is brain surgery. If you don't think you can stomach something like that, we actually have an edited version which is on the screen or down there in the description. We wanted to upload this for educational purposes because we thought it was truly fascinating. The main reason why we wanted to upload this video is because I wanted to say thank you to all the surgeons, doctors, and nurses in the world. If you're watching a video and you're one of those, you guys are truly amazing superheroes. You're literally saving people one person at a time. So I'm going to shut up now. Just wanted to give you guys a little more. Enjoy the video, guys. And 
All right, I'm going to pause it for just a second and hit on something. He said that he was going to be awake during the surgery. Um, there's reasons why doctors need a person to be awake if they're going to be doing brain surgery, and that's because everybody's brain is a little bit different, and they want to make sure that they are working on the right place and that they're helping to preserve the person's functions as they're going in and doing the surgery. Just because the person's awake, though, it doesn't mean that they're feeling pain. And so I need you to make sure you understand awake, yes, but they're comfortable. And so just kind of keep that in mind. Um, here is where I'm actually going to skip through a few little things. They start to gas him right here. So let's start here. was not quite as stable as I had wanted it to be, but you can see meningeal layers. We'll talk about meninges in a later chapter. They have been peeled back, and you're looking into this dude's head, and he's still having a conversation with them about something that his band had done. Um, they, again, want to make sure that the person is still able to communicate as they do this, because what they're going to be doing is removing a tumor from those oligodendrocytes that we had talked about earlier. They have overproduced, and so they've led to that tumor. Well, that tumor doesn't do what the brain is supposed to do, and so when they're going in to resect that tumor, they want to make sure they're just cutting the tumor and not the actual functional part of his brain that's down below that. Now, here's where I'm going to skip towards the end where they do actually get the tumor removed so you can appreciate how large it is. that they removed it was very white and that goes back to something that we're going to learn later on it's the difference between white matter and gray matter white matter is myelinated and it's the oligodendrocytes in the central nervous system that create the white matter um, so what he just had removed was a tumor of a bunch of those cells right there and so again hopefully that helped give you an appreciation behind these cells the oligodendrocytes right here and how they help to create that myelin sheath all right, moving on. Number five and number six are satellite cells and Schwann cells. 
Um, I want you to start with, get the names of them, and then bracket to the left of these two, number five and number six, and then right beside that bracket, peripheral nervous system, or PNS. Um, in this picture, the purple cells right here are the satellite cells. Notice that they surround the cell body of this particular neuron. The Schwann cells are these little bubbly cells down here, and they do the exact same thing the oligodendrocytes did, only now we're in the peripheral nervous system. These two cell types are going to come back to us as important when we start talking about regeneration within the peripheral nervous system. Um, next thing that you guys have is a picture of the multipolar neuron where you're labeling the different parts of it. Um, the picture mimics what you have in the textbook, so you shouldn't have any problems going over it, but just to hit the highlights. Mm. All of these little yellow branches coming off over here, these are all dendrites. Again, their job is to receive information and then forward it on to the cell body. Inside the cell body, you have a few, in this picture, orange mitochondria. Um, neurons are very metabolically active. They have a ton of need for ATP, and so those mitochondria are going to produce ATP for the neuron. We have the big giant purple nucleus with the nucleolus inside of it. The genes inside of there are going to be making a lot of different things, including neurotransmitters, which will come back to us later on. Um, all the blue stuff, that's the ER, and again, there is rough and smooth ER. The rough ER here is called a missile body. Um, it's the same basic function. It just has a slightly different shape than typical rough ER is going to have, but it does still have the ribosomes on the surface. The cell body kind of pinches off into an axon hillock, and at, then at that point, we become the axon terminal, which comes all the way down. It spreads into all of these little branches, and then at the end of each branch, you have an axon terminal. Um, typically, each axon terminal talks to one specific thing. Now, this happens to be a myelinated neuron because it has a myelin sheath. All of this blue stuff right here creates the myelin sheath. Each one of those bubbles is one Schwann cell here in this picture. The gaps between Schwann cells are called nodes of Ranvier, if you'd like to be French, or nodes of Ranvier for our Texas-born people. What's going to happen here is twofold. The myelin sheath creates an insulating layer so that when one neuron um, starts to communicate, it doesn't short circuit and make another neuron talk if it wasn't supposed to. And then number two, it helps speed the transmission along the axon terminal significantly. So it's not only insulating, it's also speeding things up. Um, next step you have what are the three special characteristics oh i kind of went out of order but going back up above the picture you have what are the three special characteristics of neurons that the book mentions number one neurons are amitotic that means that if you lose a neuron it's dead forever you typically can't replace them because one neuron left behind can't do mitosis to create a second one that leads also to number i'm going to go out of order here well now i can't even find it um I kind of skipped this one. Okay, number two, out of order. These cells are extremely long-lived. All the cells, all the neurons that you have right now, you've had them since before you were born. And that links back to that whole amitotic thing. You can't make more, so you need them to last as long as you are going to live. And then final one, these are super metabolically active cells. They have a very strong need for oxygen and glucose. Um, one of the first things that starts to die in your body if you run out of oxygen, in fact, is the nervous system because they absolutely have to have it to have the ATP necessary to do all the different processes that neurons have to do. All right. Uh, next up, you have defined neurotransmitters underneath your picture. Um, that's There's a good slide. I saw it nice there. Okay. Um, Here's what we have going on. This is one axon terminal. It's the end of an axon. You can kind of see it, see it blown up right here. This is the huge blown up part of this particular neuron cell body. So what's happening is this neuron is trying to talk to this neuron. So blown up, axon terminal, is trying to talk to this cell body. Okay. The way that it does that, because there is a gap between them, and electricity is not super good at being able to jump gaps. And so we have to be able to chemically take a signal from this axon terminal to this postsynaptic membrane is what that's going to be called. And the way that it does that is by releasing neurotransmitters, which are these little green balls. So neurotransmitters are just chemicals that can relay a signal from one place to another place. Um, next, myelin sheath we had hit on a little bit earlier. Um, you need to know that it's made by oligodendrocytes in the CNS and Schwann cells in the PNS. Um, you need to know that it creates insulation, like we had said earlier, and you need to know that it helps speed impulse transmission. Um, from there, you have myelinated fibers versus unmyelinated fibers. Myelinated fibers do have a myelin sheath. 
as you look at this cut through the brain, now this is a transverse cut through the brain, and it's unlike how you guys dissected it when you dissected in lab, because in lab, you did a sagittal section through the brain so that you divided it into a right and left hemisphere. Here, instead, we've done a top-bottom cut, so transverse. What I want you to notice is you can see the difference between gray matter and white matter. Gray matter is unmyelinated, white matter is myelinated, so that means if you were to look at these cells under the microscope, a really good microscope, you'd be able to see a myelin sheath all the way around the axon terminals of those cells. So myelinated fibers, they just have a myelin sheath. Unmyelinated fibers, no myelin sheath. Now going back to right here, nodes of Ranvier are the spaces between adjacent Schwann cells, and so that is a node, that's a node, that's another node. Once again, back to this picture, white matter versus gray matter. Um, white matter consists of myelinated fibers. And so coming back, I had pointed to this earlier and I said there are myelinated fibers in here. Now I'm saying if you get a bunch of myelinated fibers together, it ends up making the brain actually look white because of the fatty myelin sheet that goes around it. Um, the other thing that I'd like you to know for white matter is it tends to be used for quick communication between places. So not so much with integration. Instead, it's just relaying signals from point A to point B. When you guys dissected the brain, you should have noticed the corpus callosum. That is a huge tract of white matter that's present within the brain. The gray matter consists of unmyelinated fibers, and that tends to be where integration happens. So that's where the thinky-thinky parts of your brain happen to be. Um, that's a good place to go ahead and stop this particular video.